Hello Adams for CKLA today we are going to continue reading our small steps memoir and our chapter vocab today we have diagnosed which is a verb and that means to um, identify an illness respiratory is an adjective and that means related to breathing excruciating is an adjective and that means extremely painful and a gunny sack is a noun and that's a bag that's made of really rough cloth so not soft it's a very rough type of bag all right so you have some cause and effect questions first so it says for the questions below identify the cause and effect of each statement Number one, the flowers bloomed after all the rain. Number two, Junior earned a special treat by cleaning his room without being asked. Number three, after Maria stubbed her toe, it ached for several hours. Four, the librarian piled the books too high and they all tumbled down. Five, I have trouble concentrating if I don't eat a good breakfast. Six, which represents the central cause and effect in Condoleezza Rice's personal narrative. We read that a few lessons ago. That was a story about the father who wanted a son and he realized that he was having a daughter and he changed his mind on a lot of ideas. All right, and we are going to read Chapter 7, Part 2. This was from Star Patient Surprises Everyone, from the narrative Small Steps, The Year I Got Polio by Peg Carrot. Although I was delighted with every small accomplishment, I wondered why I got better and some of the other patients did not. Tommy might spend the rest of his life in the iron lung, and it didn't seem fair. I mentioned this to Dr. Bevis. Some cases of polio are severe and some are mild, he said. When the polio virus completely destroys a nerve center, the muscles controlled by that center are paralyzed forever. If the damage is slight rather than total, the paralysis is temporary. Your muscles were severely weakened, but the nerve damage wasn't total. It's possible for weak muscles to gain back some of their strength. So Tommy's polio is worse than mine, I said. That's right. It also helped that your parents took you to the doctor right away. You were already here and diagnosed when you needed oxygen. Some people who have respiratory polio are not that fortunate. I remembered how hard it had been to breathe and how much the oxygen tent had helped. Dr. Bevis continued, Most people think they have the flu and don't get medical help until paralysis sets in. By the time they learn they have polio they and get to a hospital that's equipped to treat them, the respiratory patients often have to go straight into an iron lung. They don't get hot packs or physical therapy until they can breathe on their own again, which might be several months later. The sooner the Sister Kenny treatments are started, the more they help. He smiled at me. You are one lucky girl. But it wasn't all luck, I thought. It was quick action by my parents. They helped create my good luck. I've been wondering something else too, I said. How did I get polio when no one not one other person in my town got it. Many people have polio and never know it, Dr. Bevis said. They are highly contagious, but because their symptoms are so slight, they don't see a doctor. There are probably thousands of cases of polio every year that are so mild they are never diagnosed. So I caught it from someone who didn't know they had it, I said. It seems unbelievable to me that anyone could have polio and not realize it. Mail was delivered every afternoon, and I looked forward to a daily letter from my mother. Most of her letters were signed, Love, Mother, and Dad, but a few were signed with a muddy paw print. Okay. Number seven asks, what word or phrase helps you know how to read with feeling and expression? Number eight, what question does Peg have in this chapter? What is she wondering? Number nine, why does Dr. Bevis believe Peg's condition is improving? Number 10, Peg also wonders why no one else in her town got polio. Is Peg getting polio a cause or an effect? Okay, we're going to continue reading. 
Oh, we already read that one. There we go. Sorry, guys. So she's saying she looks forward to that letter. Um, some were signed with a muddy paw print. Those were from BJ telling me he had chased a cat or buried a bone. Grandpa depended on mother to tell me any news, but he sent a gift each week when my parents came to visit. Art wrote about college life and sent me a new teddy bear just like the one that got burned. One mail delivery included a big brown packet from my school in Austin. When I opened it, dozens of letters from my classmates tumbled out. Karen wrote about a student petition to change the rules so girls could wear pants to school instead of the required dresses. Another girl complained that her new haircut was too short. A third was outraged at the basketball referee. I had this strange feeling that I was reading about a different time, a different lifetime. The other kids were upset about such unimportant things. Just a few weeks earlier, I too had worried about clothes and hair and the basketball team. Now none of this mattered. I had faced death. I had lived with excru excruciating pain and with loneliness and uncertainty about the future. Bad haircuts and lost ball games would never bother me again. Even the petition to allow girls to wear pants to school, a cause I supported, failed to excite me. I would happily wear a gunny sack, I thought, if I could walk into the school. Be glad you aren't here, one boy wrote. You aren't missing anything but hard tasks and too much homework. He's wrong, I thought. I miss my own room and playing with BJ and helping Grandpa in the garden. I miss my piano lessons and roller skating and licking the pan when Mother makes fudge. I miss visiting my aunts and uncles. I miss riding my bike with Karen and playing Monopoly with Richard. I put the letters aside knowing I was changed forever. My world was now the hospital. Would I have anything in common with my classmates when I went home? I felt closer now to Tommy, whose head was the only part of him that I had ever seen, than I did to the kids who used to be my dearest friends. Tommy understood what it was like to have polio. My school friends could never know. All right. So the last part, we're going to have part two. These are going to be more vocabulary type of questions. So this is a quote for you to analyze. My eyes spring open. Number 11 asks, what is the verb in the sentence above? Remember, verbs are action. Number 12, what's happening in this sentence? So the same sentence, my eyes sprang open. And number 13, what does spring tell us about the narrator's feelings in the moment? I hope you all have a wonderful day and I will see you next time. Goodbye, Adams.